Welcome back to part two of our series. We're calling this The Shadow King. We're talking about the life of David. And I'm wondering if you've ever stood face to face or toe to toe with a moral or ethical dilemma. Have you ever wrestled with a question, like a hard question of right versus wrong? Maybe you found a Tupperware container of cookies that someone left behind, and you wonder, what should I do? Should I eat a cookie? Should I call the police, get an investigation started? What should, what should I do in this difficult situation? Maybe something a little more serious. How about maybe someone uh, lost their wallet? You found a wallet on the ground somewhere, and you wonder, what should I do? I probably should turn it in, but maybe, maybe I'll keep the cash out of it. I mean, I don't want this person to have to go get a new ID and, and, and new credit cards, but you know, maybe, maybe I'll keep some of the cash as a finder's fee. What's the right thing to do? Or maybe the cashier gave you back too much change. Uh, should you give it back, or should you interpret that as God's blessing upon your life? God wanted you to have this extra money, and so he uh, caused this person to make a mistake. How would you interpret that moment and what is right and wrong? Maybe something a little bit more serious. Let's say, uh, let's assume that you are a Christian and you own a bakery. And at your bakery, you make custom cakes. And at your bakery, a gay couple comes into your bakery and they would like you to make a custom cake for their gay wedding what should you do? What's the right thing to do? That's a real life story, right? You remember that? How about this? Let's imagine that the president declares that transgender students are allowed to go into any locker room that they choose and play the sport of their choice, irregardless of biological gender differences. As a student, as a parent, what do you do with that? How do you determine what is right and what is wrong? Do you just make that decision based on what's easy? What's most convenient? What's the most comfortable? That's what will be right. Do, do you choose what is best for yourself? This is the desired outcome that I want, therefore that is the right decision. Maybe, maybe you make that decision based on what the culture tells us is right, or whatever the, the, uh, the, the news anchor says is right and wrong, whatever the politician tells us is right and wrong, whatever the celebrity tells us is right and wrong, or social media. Is that how we decide what is right or wrong? you're not a, a Christian, if you're not a follower of Jesus, probably any one of those answers makes sense. Yeah, I guess just pick one of those. But if you are a follower of Jesus, if you're living or at least trying to live a Jesus-centered life, then none of those answers are acceptable to God. In this month-long series, as we study the life of David as it's recorded in the Old Testament, we're going to see that David had a lot of life experiences where he faced, he stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with some decisions that he had to make versus right or wrong, moral and ethical decisions that he had to make. And we're going to take a look at uh, one of those this morning. Some of those decisions, and there were many, David got right. And, and some of those he got really, really wrong. But it brings us to this baseline question, how do you decide? Right versus wrong, who can say? Who gets to say? Who gets to set the standard for right and wrong? And here's why I think this sermon is so important. Here's why I believe it will be super helpful to all of us. If you are a follower of Jesus, if you have a desire to live a Jesus-centered life, and you've trusted Christ as your Savior, the Holy Spirit lives inside of you, helping you make these kinds of decisions, you know that the Word of God offers us truth. And we'll talk a little bit more about that towards the end of the sermon. But because of that, because you know that you can turn to the Word of God, that you can rely on the Holy Spirit, uh, I think this morning's sermon is going to give you a lot of confidence 
Whenever it comes time for you to stand toe-to-toe with a moral or ethical dilemma, you can go into that decision with great confidence, knowing that you can find the best answer for what is right and what is wrong. And if you're not yet a follower of Jesus, here's what's been happening in your life. Most likely, you've been working with this sliding scale, this sliding standard that, can, that you are never really confident in. That's because without God, the, the standards of right and wrong are always subjective. They're always unclear. They are inconsistent. They lead to hypocrisy. It's right for me, but it's not right for you. That happens all the time. And what you're going to hear today is just a much better way to deal with moral and ethical dilemmas in life. There's so many conflicting opinions around us in this world over what's right, what's wrong. And if you're just if you're tired of the, of the hopeless tension of never really being sure what's right or what's wrong, if you're tired of the inconsistency, you're tired of the hypocrisy that we see in our American culture, I think this sermon is going to be super helpful for you. So what we're going to do first, we're going to jump right into a moral dilemma, right into an ethical dilemma that David faced in the book of 1 Samuel. If you join me in 1 Samuel chapter 24... 1 Samuel 24. Let me give you a little bit of background as to how we got to this moment in chapter 24. We'll fill in a a, a few more details later, but for right now, what you need to know is that Saul, King Saul, who is the current king of Israel in this moment, is out there chasing David. David's on the run as a fugitive. Saul wants him dead, and Saul is out there actively looking for him. Now, in, in the process of doing that, as Saul's running all over the, the countryside looking for David, the Philistines find out that that's what he's doing. The Philistines are like, hey, the king of Israel is distracted. He's out there running around after some guy. Let's go raid some towns. Let's go raid some villages. And that's exactly what they did. So Saul has to stop looking for David. He has to go and deal with this Philistine problem. We jump into chapter 24. And as soon as the Philistine problem is, is kind of quelled down, Saul gets back to looking for David. Here we go. Verse 1. After Saul returned from fighting the Philistines, he was told that David had gone into the wilderness of En Gedi. So Saul chose 3,000 elite troops from all Israel and went to search for David and his men near the rocks of the wild goats. And at the place where the road passes some sheepfolds, Saul went into a cave to relieve himself. But as it happened, David and his men were hiding farther back in that very cave. David's friends whispered to him in verse 4, Now's your opportunity, David. Today, the Lord is telling you, I will certainly put your enemy into your power to do with as you wish. So David crept forward And he cut off a piece of the hem of Saul's robe. Then David's conscience began bothering him because he had cut off or he had cut Saul's robe. And he said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do this to my Lord, the king. I should not attack the Lord's anointed one for the Lord himself has chosen him. So David restrained his men and did not let them kill all. So the moral ethical dilemma that David faced in this moment, in this cave, should he kill the man who is out there trying to kill him while he's relieving himself? I'll admit this, this lesson would be a lot, uh, a lot more fun if it was like a youth lesson and was just junior high boys in the room. We would have a lot of fun with this story. But I'm going to keep it professional. You get what's going on, right? David decided in this moment, and I think his friends make a pretty good argument for why he should kill Saul while he's relieving himself. But David says, not right. It's not right to do that. And he based that decision on one 
factor, and the factor was this, the Lord forbids it. God said it's not right, and that's the end of the discussion, guys. Now listen again to his friend's argument. I think it's pretty solid. Based on human reason, it makes a lot of sense. They say, David, of all the caves that are around, he came into the one that we're hiding in. Like this guy's been on, on, on the road and he's been walking around and, and now, like at this moment, like today, at this particular time, this is when he needs to you know, relieve himself in this cave. It's got to mean that God wants you to kill him. It has to mean that. The timing's too perfect. And David's response is no. The Lord forbids it. God says no, and that's the end of the discussion. Whoa, 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 wait, David, hear us out. Hear us out. Let's, let's go back and remember why we're in this cave. Let's remember how we got here, because we didn't just wake up one day and, and say, hey, you know what would be fun? Let's go on a camping trip, and we'll hide out in a cave. That's not why we're here, David. After David killed Goliath, David was having a lot of success in battle against the Philistines to the point where people were noticing, and they're writing songs about it, and their songs uh, were being sung that Saul's killed thousands, but David's killed tens of thousands, and Saul didn't like that. And so there was this jealousy that began to build in him that became this bitter hatred towards David, and he wanted him dead. In fact, uh, on two occasions, while David was playing the harp for, for Saul, Saul threw a spear at him twice, tried to kill him. Saul tried to get David out onto the battlefield as often as possible, not because he was rooting for David to vanquish the enemies of the Philistines. He was trying to get him out on the battlefield as as often as possible so the Philistines could do the dirty work for him. He's just playing the law of averages. You're on the battlefield uh, more and more and more. Law of averages says eventually you're probably going to get killed. And that's what he was banking on. That's what he was hoping for. He had asked, Saul had asked his son Jonathan to get some guys together and kill David. But Jonathan and David had become best friends and Jonathan wouldn't do it. So Saul's like, all right, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give David one of my daughters as a wife. He tried that twice. And the second time, David did accept this marriage uh, proposal, and he married this, uh, this girl, the, this princess, Michael. And, and Saul's intent was, uh, if, I can, if I can do that, well, then that's going to give me an upper hand. That's going to give me the opportunity to manipulate some things, and when the time is right, then I'll be able to get David. And he tried one night uh, to send some hitmen, uh, and he was hoping that, that Michael would cooperate, and she didn't, and helped David escape. She loved him. You have all of these things happening in the background until finally David had to go on the run like a fugitive and he had done nothing wrong. David went to a couple different places and there were some people that had helped him get some food, get some protection, some shelter. He, uh, he's on the run. And Saul, when he went out looking for David, uh, he finds out that there was these people that had helped David. Now, they didn't know that David was on the run as a fugitive. They didn't know, they didn't know that uh, Saul was angry with David, that he wanted to kill him. They didn't have Instagram. It wasn't on his tweet like, hey, if you see this guy, turn him in. That didn't happen. They didn't know that Saul was angry with David. And so when Saul shows up and he's angry with these people who had helped him, they're like, well, we didn't know, and he didn't care. He had one of his guys kill all of them. He killed He killed priests, he killed women, he killed children, he killed animals, all dead. David, do you know what he did? He killed innocent people. He deserves to die while he's relieving himself in a cave. David said, no. The Lord forbids it. God said no, and that's the end of it. David, listen, you've already been anointed by God. God's already rejected Saul. He's anointed you as the next king. All we're doing is speeding up the process. It's going to happen eventually anyway. No. 
The Lord forbids it. God says no, and that's the end of it. The tension between David's friends and David in this moral dilemma is because David's friends were approaching this situation with what we would now call today situational ethics. I don't know if you've heard that phrase or not, but situational ethics is the belief that a decision between right and wrong is, is determined on the, the desired outcome. In other words, if you think it's right, uh, if you think it's the most loving thing to do, if you think it's uh, the, the best possible uh, scenario, the outcome that would possibly be the best in this situation, then that's the right answer. And then you come to this situation and you do it all over again. Well, it just depends on the situation. Maybe you've heard that. Maybe you've even said that. The greatest problem with situational ethics is that absolute truth does exist. And that absolute truth transcends the situation. If you let the situation define truth, Instead of truth determining what you will do in a situation, every decision between right and wrong, every moral and ethical dilemma will become subjective and unreliable and inconsistent. If the standard between right and wrong is determined by a person's desired outcome, What happens when someone else has a different desired outcome than you? Well, now you've got a conflict, don't you? They have a desired outcome, you've got a desired outcome, and now they're at odds with one another. Haven't we been seeing a lot of that in our culture? So who then gets to set the standard? Is it whoever has the, more, the, the most power? Is, is that who gets to set the standard? Is it whoever has the most money? Do they get to set the standard? Maybe it's whoever's the most famous. Whoever's famous, clearly they need to be the one who gets to set the standard of right and wrong because they're famous. Maybe it's, maybe it's the majority, right? If, if most people think this, then it must be what's right. If three wolves and a sheep were sitting around a fire talking about what they should have for dinner, I don't think the sheep is going to want to take a vote. Just because the majority believe that something is right or wrong, is that reliable? Is that always consistent? You and I, or any other human gets to set the standard for ourselves, gets to set the standard for other humans, the chances of that standard being reliable, being consistent, is zero. It won't happen. There will always be this this conflict. Situational ethics always results in inconsistency and eventually hypocrisy. It's okay for me, but it's not okay for you. It happens that way because you got a bunch of people running around setting their own standards, believing that if I think my cause is right, then whatever I do is right. One of the saddest examples in our American experience has been abortion. We are told, we are, we are told that we must believe that. The child in the womb is a lifeless blob of tissue until that lifeless blob of tissue is born and then it magically becomes a child. It magically then has life. And in recent years, it's not even at birth, is it? In recent years, it's well, maybe, maybe sometime after birth. Maybe if the doctor says it's alive, if the, maybe it's the mom who gets to say it's alive. We are told that a child is not a child until someone other than the child declares that it's a child. Well, that's a pretty subjective standard of life. I'm not talking about 
uh, we, you know, we lost a wallet. We're talking about the life of a child. I, I think we should have a higher standard of thought than that. Now, if we look to God to find the answers, if, if we look to God's Word to find the answer, we're going to find um, a, a much more confident definition of life. Would you look with me in Psalm 139? In Psalm 139, we have something written by David. Written about God. Written about unborn life. Here we go. Psalm 139, verse 13. You made, talking about God, you, you made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous, how well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion, as, as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life, was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. From God's perspective, life begins at conception. Think about this with me. Those of you maybe who've tried to wrestle maybe with compassion and, and some of the tensions that we'll talk about in just a moment and whether or not abortion is acceptable in certain circumstances or whatever. You've maybe tried to wrestle with some of those things. Have you ever thought about the soul? Because I think if you're a Christian or you're watching this today and, and uh, you, you've uh, at least been around the idea of an eternal soul and you're kind of on board with that, if you believe in an eternal soul, when is that soul created? When is that soul connected to that child? Is it at the moment of birth? Is that when the soul is created and connected to the child? Is it sometime when the doctor says, oh yes, this child is alive, and now it gets its soul? Is that how it works? Not according to God's word. There's life there. There's the, the, this, this, uh, this, this purpose and this plan for this child was ordained by God before he ever took a breath outside the womb. Here's why situational ethics distorts this conversation about right and wrong. We are told that we have to protect this, this right to abortion for the health of women. What about rape? What about incest? What about death? Don't you care about women? Do you want women to die? You're a terrible person. You call yourself a, a Christian that loves people. Don't love women, right? These are the kinds of things that are said if you don't agree with the practice of abortion. We are led to believe that compassion for women is the reason that we have to, we have to continue the practice of abortion. So why, why are women actually getting abortions? If that's true... You know, there must be thousands and thousands of women that would die. There must be many, many women who are being raped and forced into making decisions that are just really, really difficult and terrible decisions to have to make. According to the Gutmutcher Institute, who has uh, done intensive research into studying Reasons why abortions take place. Reasons why women have abortions. Those having an abortion because of rape, 0.05% of the reasons given, 0.05, less than 1%. Florida, the state of Florida did their own internal state study in 2018, and according to their numbers, it's 0.14% percent of the reason. What about incest? That must be a pretty prevalent thing, right? It must be happening all over the place. Those having an abortion because of incest, 0.01 percent. Hmm. 
Well, how about uh, the life of the mother, the, the health of the mother? We, we, we don't want women to die. We don't want women to be hurting. Maybe that's, maybe that's why this is happening. According to the Gutmutcher Institute, those who gave a reason for health reasons, 4%, 4%. According to the Florida research, overall health was 1.48% overall health concerns. That they, but they studied, like, not just, okay, there's some health issues where we have some concerns. Like, they also studied those who had a higher potential of actual death. And of those, they found it was 0.27%. The facts of the numbers just don't seem to match up. The math doesn't match up with the claims that are being made about those who want to continue the, the practice of abortion. Although, okay, well, maybe it's just the Gutmutcher Institute, right? They're trying to promote a, a pro-life stance, and so maybe they're skewing things. So I went to factcheck.org, not exactly a pro-life organization. According to factcheck.org, 600 women die each year due to complications from pregnancy and childbirth. I think you would agree with me that's heartbreaking, that's tragic. If that was my wife, if that was my sister, if that was someone that I loved, it would be heartbreaking. But you take that 600 deaths and you bring it up to the fact that there are 1 million abortions every year. Now all of a sudden, the reasons that they're giving us for why we have to do this don't seem to mathematically add up. The article, I didn't write this sentence, factcheck.org wrote this sentence, quote, that doesn't mean that an abortion would have saved the life of the mother in those cases. What? Then what does it mean? It means an abortion removes the risk of pregnancy. That's what it means. Abortion removes the risk of pregnancy. Well, removing my fingers and my toes from my body removes the risk of frostbite. I'm not doing that. But that's what they want us to believe. The reason given to defend abortion is not the real reason that they want to continue the practice of abortion. And they're using situational ethics to try to manipulate people's love and compassion into accepting something that is wrong and believing that it is right. Could, could we, as followers of Christ, could we feel the tension over some really difficult decisions that people have to make in life and really difficult circumstances in that 1%? Could we feel that tension Absolutely we should. Could we have compassion and offer care and, and, and love and support to that 1% that's going through something really, really hard? Yeah, we should. Could we offer love and grace and forgiveness to women who have already had abortions rather than shame? Yeah, by God's grace and His standards of forgiveness and love, we absolutely should. But situational ethics should not be driving our decisions on what is right and wrong. Especially when we're talking about something as serious as the life of a child. So what then is the standard? Well, the Bible reveals to us that God is holy, that God sets the standards based on His own holiness, based on His own standard of love. God is holy, God is love. We don't set the standard of love. God sets the standard of love. God sets the standard of holiness because that's who He is. If what we want, if what we think comes in conflict with what God has determined is right and wrong, God wins that argument because He's God and I'm not and you're not. You know, using human reasoning... I think we can make a pretty strong argument that David should have killed Saul while he was relieving himself. Pretty strong argument. 
mean, at least we could have said to, to David, listen, all right, you don't want to kill the guy. At least go up and you like use some Taekwondo, give him a noogie, take his clothes, kick him out of the cave, and so embarrass him really bad. At least do something to the guy. David's response to his friends is no. God forbids it. God says no, and that's it. We're done talking about it. Well, how was, how was David coming to this conclusion? You know, he, didn't, he didn't have the, the, the New Testament that you and I have, but he did have the, the law of Moses. Leviticus 19.18 says, Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against one of your own people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. David was confident that God forbid lifting a hand against Saul, even if he deserved it. I'm so thankful that the gospel of Jesus Christ is not based on human reason. What if God applied human reason? What if, what if God applied situational ethics to our sin problem? We'd be in trouble. Go with me to Romans chapter 3. If God applied situational ethics to our sin problem when we die, we would be in trouble. Romans chapter 3, let's start in verse 10. The scriptures say this, No one is righteous, not even one. No one is truly wise. No one is seeking God. All have turned away. All have become Useless. No one does good, not a single one. Verse 18, they have no fear of God at all. Verse 19, obviously the law applies to those to whom it was given. For its purpose is to keep people from having excuses. In other words, it points out where we've gone wrong in our thinking, in our behaviors, in our attitudes, and to show the entire world is guilty before God. For no one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands. The law simply shows us how sinful we are. We've got a problem. And based on human reason, based on situational ethics, when we die, what do we deserve? We deserve spiritual death. Romans 6.23 says as much. The wages of sin, the payment of that is deserved for our sin is death, spiritual death, separation from God. We've got a problem. I'm so thankful that God does not apply situational ethics to our sin problem. Instead, He applies grace. Verse 21, But now God has shown us a way to be made right with Him without keeping the requirements of the law, as was promised in the writings of Moses. If it was up to us, if it was based on our ability to do the right thing all the time, without hope. Verse 22, we are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. Everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard, and yet God freely and graciously declares that we are righteous. He did this through Christ Jesus when He freed us from the penalty of our sins. For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed His life, shedding His blood. This sacrifice shows that God was being fair when he held back and did not punish those who sinned in past times. For he was looking ahead and including them in what he would do in this present time. God did this to demonstrate his righteousness, for he himself is fair and just. He declares sinners to be right in his sight when they believe in Jesus. You apply human reason, you apply situational ethics to our sin problem, what we deserve is hell. But Jesus offers grace. Jesus offers his own life as a sacrificial payment for your sin in your place. Is that fair? No, it's not fair. Does it make sense that an innocent person has to die so that a guilty person can be declared innocent? Not according to situational ethics, it doesn't make any sense. 
And so we can be very thankful that God doesn't treat us as our sin deserves. Rather, He offers us grace. And if you haven't yet made that decision to trust Christ, to repent of your sin and trust Him as your Savior, I pray that you will today. So if God is the one then who sets the standard of right and wrong based on His own holiness, based on His own love, how do we know then what God expects? I'm going to give you three very simple ways to know and be confident about what is right and what is wrong. Three simple things that you can do. Here's the first one. 2 Timothy 3.16. 2 Timothy 3.16. All Scripture from beginning to end is inspired by God. What you are reading is not just something that a bunch of guys from thousands of years ago wrote. It's not an opinion. They're not metaphors. This is God inspired. What you have in your lap was inspired by God through His Holy Spirit, preserved by God through the power of the Holy Spirit, so that what you and I are holding is the Word of God, which is what makes it reliable, which what makes it trustworthy. And because of that, all Scripture is inspired by God. Because of that, it is useful to teach us what's true, to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong, and it teaches us to do what is right. You want to know what's right? You want to know what's wrong? Study God's Word. That's the first step. You've got to study God's Word because it reveals God's character. It reveals God's nature, His holiness, His standard of love. It reveals His boundary lines and His principles. Study God's Word. Here's the the next thing we need to do. After we are studying God's Word, look at James 1.5. So you're studying God's Word. Now you've got an ethical or a uh, moral dilemma. You're, you, how do I apply it? I, I'm, I'm reading God's Word. I'm studying it. I'm learning what it says, but how do I apply it? This is a tough one. What do I do? Verse 5 of James 1, if you need wisdom, what's wisdom? Wisdom is the application of knowledge. So you've got knowledge of God's Word. How do I apply it? If you need wisdom, ask our generous God and He'll give it to you. So study God's Word and then pray and ask God to give you wisdom on how to apply it, even to the most difficult of situations. And when you do that, and you study God's Word, you pray and ask for God, ask God for wisdom, here's the end result. Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. Verse 16. Paul writes, So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives, and then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. Simple nature wants to do evil, which is the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are opposite of what the sinful nature desires. You've got this battle between right and wrong in your choices every day. So what do you do with that? Well, you you read God's Word, you study God's Word, you pray and ask God for wisdom. And as these two forces, it says, are constantly fighting each other, And you feel that tension, you rely on the Holy Spirit and His power to guide you and direct you and help you make wise choices. I'm going to make this very personal now. I'm not asking in in, in a big picture way. I'm not asking in a theoretical way or in a philosophical way. I'm going to ask you personally. How do you determine what is right and wrong? You personally, how do you do that? How do you come to those conclusions? As you look at the pattern of your life, how have you come to conclusions over right versus wrong? Do you pick what is easiest? Do you pick what is most convenient? Do you pick what is the most comfortable? Maybe you choose whatever, uh, whatever will result in the outcome that you desire. Maybe you choose whatever it is the culture has told you is right or wrong, whatever the news anchor tells you is right and wrong. The celebrity, well, LeBron James said it, so it must be true. Maybe it just depends on the situation. In this situation, I feel like this is the best thing. In this situation, I think this must be the best thing. So you trust yourself. You you trust your. Your, your heart, like your motives could never be off. 
Your, your thinking could never be distorted. Your righteousness, your holiness is so high that you trust yourself to be able to be the standard bearer of decisions of right and wrong. I don't trust myself. I certainly don't trust you. None of these options are reliable. They're not consistent. They're going to lead to hypocrisy because what we're going to do is we're going to say it's good for me, but not for you. That's going to happen because selfishness and pride, a desire for control will eventually taint those decisions. The only way to be confident to know that right versus wrong, when we stand toe-to-toe or or face-to-face with a a dilemma, a moral or ethical dilemma, is to depend on the one who sets the standards for right and wrong, based on his own holiness, based on his own standard of love. So I'm going to leave you with a question to wrestle with it personally, to maybe talk about it with your family, and it's this. Is there something in your life right now that is in conflict with God's standard? Is there something in your life that right now is in conflict with God's standard? Okay, what are you going to do about that? And if you're tired of working with this sliding standard that you can never really be confident in because everything's subjective, everything's unclear, and it's all situational, then stop looking at the Bible like it's some, uh, just another book that you put on your shelf, another book you put on the coffee table, and start looking at it as what it really is. It is our guidebook for life. It's the source of truth. It's what reveals to us God's heart and His standards of holiness and His standards of love, and start praying, asking God for wisdom, and trust in the Holy Spirit to help you make good, wise decisions and choices, even when they're really, really hard ones over what's right and what's wrong.